Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Well, I am so excited to celebrate with you today, Sabrina Monarch. Now, Sabrina is someone that I've actually been watching for so many years. She's been this presence and just very consistently sharing her love of astrology. And I also know that like me, she's a bit of a nerd. Well, look, I'm quite the nerd actually, but she is also somebody with an academic background in astrology, specifically the MA program in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness that she took. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but the really exciting news is that Sabrina is coming to Synchronicity University as part of the November speaker series. And I'm so happy about this because it really is some of these emerging and established brilliant minds in astrology today, teaching incredible topics as well. And Sabrina is one of them. And now for a very limited time, about two weeks left to choose your tuition rate, as low as just $5 a class, which is really an unheard of rate for this quality of astrologer. And we're gonna have Sabrina there as well, which is just so exciting. I am so grateful for her and I am so happy to celebrate her. Sabrina, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Nadia, for having me. I found your YouTube channel at the very start of my astrology career and was so inspired and so lit up by you. It was so wonderful to meet you at Norwalk recently and see you again at ESAR. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here. You've been in my sphere. Let's put it that way. You're so part of my consciousness or something. And it really is the stuff you've been doing online that I loved. And I was just so proud of you when you were completing your MA and that journey you were going through, because I remember going through that journey as well. Oh, yeah. I remember you like commented on a post that I made where I was like transitioning, moving, and I asked for advice and you pitched in with your sagacious wisdom. And yeah, thank you. I love it. I love it. And so now here you are, you are established and thriving in the astrology community, which is so amazing to watch. I, you know, I love being part of like people really coming up, right? I, I, I learned this actually from an incredible astrologer named Donna Van Toen, who really loved nurturing talent. And so that is in me. And so I know it's a very small part, I'm sure that I've played, but I have loved watching you just to bloom and come into your own voice as an astrologer and really establish your own presence online and your own voice as well. Thank you. Okay, so here we are. I do want to mention Sabrina is a trooper. Let's just say that she is a trooper. She had dental surgery, right? All kinds of things going on. So she's going to be speaking in a much more patient pace than I am because I tend to be very excited and enthusiastic. But she's got so much. And now to you're say. getting me to smile. <laughs> That's great. I know you were saying earlier, like, oh, I don't know if I can smile so much because, you know, but I'm glad that you're smiling. That's amazing. Okay. So at Synchronicity University for the November speaker series, you are going to be talking about Eros. This is an incredible topic. What can you tell us about the asteroid Eros, especially in astrology? So I love working with the asteroid Eros. Um, I actually constellate it with Saturn and with Psyche primarily. And when I was researching Eros, I found that Saturn was always in the room, like not the myth Saturn, not Kronos, the archetype of Saturn, because with Eros, we have this really profound level of aliveness. It can be like the deepest, most powerful sensations that we've ever felt. And Saturn shows up in the way that we really restrict and block and repress the erotic or directly facilitate it. You have people doing practices or people building an ethic um, or a life around the acknowledgement of Eros. But Eros, you know, I like to think about how Cupid is literally piercing people with uh, Eros, right? <laughs> the other like spelling of Eros. And it's uncomfortable to be rattled with the most powerful, potent sensations that we've ever felt. And so I think there's a great kind of defense that the psyche can erect to not feel that, you know, or the kind of 
turmoil or anguish that we can feel when we desire a person um, or desire, you know, the proverbial like unavailable partner. And we have all of these sensations moving through us, but no relief really. And so when I look into the myth of Eros, um, there's the famous Eros and Psyche romance. And I like to think of this not just as two different characters, but actually parts of our own psyche, right? And Psyche and Psyche have the same name. So I think about the poetics of like, Psyche yearns for the erotic, Psyche yearns to be alive. And Psyche has this um, glimpse of union with this God who she doesn't even get to really see. He only visits her at night and the lights are off and he's not revealing his true identity really. But she's having this experience and the drama, you know, between them leads to them being separated for a moment of time. And she is absolutely bereft. Like she um, is nearly like struggling to live really and going through all of these trials to be reunited with Eros. And I think that it's more than just like a damsel in distress or like romance, like Disney, like, you know, reunite kind of story. I think it's actually about the psyche's yearning to reconnect with something deeper to reconnect with Eros in a more permanent way. And I think, you know, maybe if you're a Plutonic person, if you have a lot of Pluto aspects or, you know, you've got something Scorpionic going on, I think a lot of people can relate to this experience of falling in love and having like a glimpse of like a really deep feeling state and then losing the person who was the portal to that state. And then what do you do? It's like, do you collapse? Do you reject that part of yourself that opened? Do you say, you know, oh, it was just uh, a one-time like opening and now I'm done or now I'm closed off. And so there is a real impasse that happens of how do we integrate this profound aliveness? Do we become hardened and crusty <laughs> in like the Saturn way of it? Or does it require that we elevate the standards of our entire life, which is another way that we enact Saturn? So I really find when I think about Eros, you know, on the one hand, the person who is embodying Eros is lighting fires everywhere they go. They're creating intense feelings and strong feelings in the people around them. And that may not even be something that is their goal. They're just, you know, they've got it going on. They've like really tuned into themselves at such a deep level that they're sparking um, deep sensation in other people. And in the early kind of um, studies of Eros, or I don't know if I'd say studies, but like the early understanding of Eros, it actually is the origin of advertisement in the sense that when we see like a billboard or we see a commercial and suddenly we want something, we've been struck by Cupid's bow. Like now we have desire that's leading us in a direction. So Eros is a kind of tool of the advertiser or the magician, you know, anyone who's practicing glamour magic or enchantment magic is working with the erotic. Um, so powerful. But then to, yeah. 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 And so when we are looking at it, I mean, I love the mythology, of course, you know, I'm, I, I really believe that we live these myths, like, and you just illustrated it so perfectly. I think just about everybody, no matter, you know, how you'd like to feel or say you are removed from it, we all have had that experience where we feel that desire, like you said, right? Like that bow hits you, that portal opens, and it's a portal of desire. And sometimes it's unrequited, sometimes it's fulfilled, sometimes only for a moment. But then there's also that sense of uh, that person perhaps not being able to be um, completely available to always be the gateway to that portal, the way that we might want, right? And we, I think everybody really, if you've lived, you've probably had that experience in one way or another. And what is it in terms of like astrologically, like when I'm looking at my chart and I'm looking at the placement of arrows, the asteroid arrows in my chart, what can that tell me about how I engage that energy? And I'm like right now, very curious to go look at my chart and see where my Eros is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can speak to the nature of how we, um, 
how we play Cupid. So how we particularly are striking or piercing. Um, I think Eros will speak to that in the chart. And then, you know, if it's conjunct a planet, it may also be infusing that planet with that kind of potency. But then if we want to look at kind of like a storyline, we can also look to asteroid psyche and even see like, are they in aspect? Are they in signs that are in aversion, right? Because there's certain parts of the myth where they can't see each other or they're not in the same, you know, or they're at odds. They're in a like opposing moment of the story. Um, one of my students has Eros and Psyche conjunct at the IC. And she said that growing up, there was a portrait of Eros and Psyche in her childhood home in the moment of union, you know? So it was like, manifested literally like that. Um, and then I think we can also look to Saturn in the chart and just kind of see the way that we're wired to create structure and also wired to create these deeper kinds of defense mechanisms and how if we compare it to where Eros is, we can kind of start to piece together what might be going on there in terms of what has awakened this kind of like wild life force in us and how are we then building a life in response to that or building a life to defend from that wow and so the placement of eros and especially in relationship to psyche that's something that we really want to look at in terms of understanding how we might personally engage with that that um uh, you mentioned it like a charisma, I guess, I, and maybe that's not the right word because the sun is more charisma, but you talked about how people who are very in tune with their eros, they're able to be people who are that much more attractive to others. Right. And I think if we give, you know, Psyche some more depth too, because in the myth, she is going after eros. She is chasing that, or she's wanting to be reunited. Um, but I also think of her too, it's like she grows up um, and she's extraordinarily beautiful. Her, um, and she's not getting any marriage proposals. Her, old, her sisters are, but she's so beautiful that people are intimidated and won't ask her out <laughs> basically. Wow. And wow. so there's something about her that is extraordinary that's actually creating a sense of alienation for her. And when she does unite with Eros, it is this kind of wish fulfillment. It's this sense of, here it is, you know, and then she's separated from it. And so it's this kind of pain of lack and then fulfillment and then lack again and being like, now I've tasted something, like how do I return to that state? And I think if we uh, reverse engineer it in another way, we could think about how psyche um, could relate to our relationship with personal development, like how deeply we're willing to get to know ourselves. And I think that the more we open to a relationship with self, say like we're understanding our astrology chart and we're doing divination and we're reflecting and introspecting very deeply about what happens in our life, then life becomes increasingly psychedelic, I've noticed. Like things touch us more deeply, like we're more alive and awake in our own essence and it leaves space for that union with the erotic. Um, and Eros is attracted to Psyche. He falls in love with her when he first sees her. There is a, a connection between them. But I do think in the myth, Psyche is much more vulnerable. Like she's the one who really kind of carries a lot of the emotional burden of the situation. And I think Eros is kind of in that position of like sparking, you know, and creating fires wherever he goes. And so I think there is a, um, a quality in that. Um, of some kind of power differential. But if we look at it as two parts of ourselves too, it could be the part of us that is able to generate that aliveness versus the part of us that wants to receive it. Um, and even looking at how balanced those things are within us or which one we tend more toward. Wow. And so we can have an understanding as to whether or not we are the people who like to pursue or like to be pursued. Is that like a good way to put it in a way? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, I think yeah. like, or even parts of the chart, like houses where we're, you know, wishing to receive that infusion from Eros mm -hmm. um, or be like met by Eros versus where, you know, we are the ones generating it. And I think even meditating on bringing those characters together in our chart, you know, can be like forming some kind of inner marriage, like something amical, just as a personal reflection. 
Okay, to be completely selfish here for a moment, can I tell you my placement? Because the reason Please, I was just yeah. a little busy because I was looking up my chart and I'm not going to share my chart out there because I, I, that's something I don't do, but I will tell you the placement. And it's very exciting for me. Like as you're talking and I'm relating it to my chart, it's just like blowing my mind. I have to tell you because it is so profound how I am considering how these energies interact. So I will tell you. My Eros is conjunct my son in the eighth, and it is trine. <laughs> know, right? Holy cow! And it is trine of psyche in the eleventh conjunct my part of fortune, and that it's all air energy there too. So I mean, how how would you look at that? How would you interpret that? You're the expert on Eros. Just thinking about Eros conjunct the sun is like a really big deal to me. I actually have arrows conjunct the sun too. <laughs> yes. So I think there is something also about being in the public, right? And like, we are our brands essentially. So that connection of arrows with advertising and the sun, it's like, all I have to do is be myself. And that is my business, right? So I think like the sun arrows, there is a way that, yeah, your solar essence conveys arrows. Uh, from the eighth house and like you're talking about astrology which is you know of the occult essentially and then the 11th house relating to the internet and there's that trine there so the ease between them also maybe suggests that you've had like there's a conversation that's easily accessible between them so maybe a sense too I think of like the 11th house as like wishes and dreams right? It's our ideals. And the eighth house relates to these underworld journeys or these deeper confrontations with um, the psyche, really. So yeah, I guess it. like, yeah, I'm just thinking of like the harmony between those spheres of life, you know, relating to um when you've had like aspirations, if you've been really willing to go do the depth work that it invites, right? Because I don't think like when we have aspirations and wishes, it's a very upward journey, but we come up against emotional blocks of like why we don't think it's possible or like why we can't have it or what stopped us before. And so we have to be able to like dive and like have like a death and rebirth process. Um, so your son Eros in the eighth house is like, burning and like generating that kind of like phoenix like willingness to go in like that um and then psyche on the 11th is like willing to be like mused by the aspirations and the wishes wow i love that you mentioned the phoenix because we are actually not that far away from halloween and i'm one of those people who thinks of halloween as very sacred like personally i feel like halloween is an opportunity to really connect with an archetype of some kind that you desire to emphasize or really uh, delve into an understanding of it. Like you are putting on the costume of an archetype that invites you to go to a deeper level and acknowledge that archetype within you. And so to me, it's always been so sacred. I always take a lot of care to choose my costume. And I will tell you between you and I and everybody watching this, um, I've been thinking about being a Phoenix for this Halloween. Because that's how I feel. I really feel like I'm in this zone. I'm in this energy right now that I feel as if I, I just finished a sabbatical and that was like, you know, the going within. And now I feel like that Phoenix rising. So it's so interesting that you correlated that Phoenix with Eros in the eighth and the sun being there as well. Yeah. And even costume and like getting dressed up as a way to like merge with a persona. And like have a transformative experience from that feels very sun arrows in the eighth. Uh, just as a side note, there was this book and I, I forget the name of the author, but it was called Pop Culture Magic. That was the name of the book. And basically what this person was saying was that when there are these uh, characters that we see in movies that resonate very strongly with the collective, that is actually a reinvention of a sacred energy that desires to be known in the psyche of modern people that desires to be acknowledged wow. in some way. Isn't that so powerful? So he was using the example of Star Trek, 
or Star Wars. I mean, those are very powerful examples of how myth and, and they chose it like George Lucas chose very consciously with Star Wars to reenact certain myths to engage the work of Joseph Campbell, who really explored the power of myth so powerfully. And so, yes, he makes these correlations between different stories. I mean, if you think about it, for me, it really was Neo in the Matrix. I have loved Neo in the Matrix for over 20 years. I've seen the Matrix first movie like 332 times, I tell you, something like that. And um, it's interesting how that is a story of, on the one hand, like the chosen one. On the other hand, it ends, like the third part ends with him being like a Christ figure. So it's really interesting how these characters, they have that ability to help us to bring forward something within us that we recognize as sacred that connects with that archetypal energy. Wow. I, yeah, film is such a beautiful example of that, like, resonance in the psyche of an image. Um, and it has me thinking about, you know, when a person is embodying Eros, it's like, you have an interaction with them, and they're on your mind later. Right. And the quality of like, making oneself that striking I think is like something that if we're thinking about glamour magic or enchantment, or if you have a personal brand and you're wanting to get yourself out there, there is a cultivation of the erotic um, to do that. And I think there is a, um, a harmony or a relationship between the psyche where if, um, if one is developing themselves to cultivate that level of attraction or attention, it's not without a learning curve, right? If you're going out and like turning heads, there is a way that the psyche or the personal consciousness has to be able to hold that level of reflection from the environment or even learn the social skills to navigate that. And I mean, some people have that experience. They're just kind of like born with it and they didn't say like work toward it. And other people do put a lot of energy into cultivating their appearance or their charisma so that they will have that kind of experience. Um, and it's something that when I think about Eros, it's like, uh, well, a lot of archetypes have led me to think that the Venusian and like beauty is actually a lot deeper than it can be given credit for when we say it's something that's kind of frivolous or superficial. Because we're looking at the erotic, it's about being able to merge. It's about being able to have an experience that feels like you're brought totally to life by it. So I think there is a call within the erotic towards excellence. This is something that Audre Lorde talks about in her essay, Uses of the Erotic. Like it's a way of, you know, if you're developing your charisma or your personal presence or your style and you're intending to be striking or you're kind of like playing out your inner celebrity or like inner demigod or inner demigoddess, you know, there's a, um, there's a way that you're making a choice or a decision to elevate your life above the mundane, or as um, Audre Lorde puts it in the essay, above the mediocre. And she says in this essay that part of like the use of the erotic is that it gives us a standard to aspire to. Like once we've experienced it, we can accept no less of ourselves. And I think that's what Psyche's original torment is in the myth when she's met Eros and then is separated because she can't go back to her life without Eros, you know? And I think that a lot of us will have that kind of archetypal journey of finding how we get back or continually find our way to the pulse of Eros as it keeps changing form, right? Like we can't get fixated um, or disempowered about how we meet the erotic. Um, but to find out how we actually cultivate a receptivity toward it and understand our own capacity to create it. It's interesting because I'm reminded of um, the work, uh, an essay by uh, an early Christian philosopher named St. Augustine. And St. Augustine said that many of us have this notion Oh, I love that, Augustine. Yeah, right? He's very poetic, right? He's got these layers of... I mean, he's written a lot about like the daemon, which is also like to be enthused and the inspiration behind divination and astrology and things like that. But when he's talking about Eros, he was saying that we have come to associate love with Eros 
And because of that, we end up going down a road where um, perhaps we become vulnerable in ways that aren't necessarily good for us. And so we can actually train ourselves to not associate eros with love, but rather wow. associate love with higher principles like honesty and loyalty and friendship. And I thought that that was so fascinating. When I read that, that made such an impression on me because I thought about how, yeah, Eros is so addictive. Like I've got Eros in the eighth house. So, you know, I could get right in there and it's so addictive. And you, you go to these really intense places where you feel things so strongly that, yeah, it has a, a lure to it. But I think the distinction is how do we understand love? Because love and Eros may not necessarily be the same thing. And maybe like, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, maybe that's part of the torment, right? Part of the torment is that we want Eros to be love. We want Eros to be, as you were mentioning, Saturn, right? Saturn, that stability, that commitment. For me, Saturn is in my first house. It's not really aspecting any of these, these other uh, placements of Psyche or Eros. And so it's so fascinating to me that we want love to become a Venus and Saturn, right? That's ultimately what we want, like that committed love and sweetness and light. But what inspires us towards love is how Eros speaks to us when we play Psyche. And as you mentioned, that portal, we have come to associate that portal with love, but it's actually a whole other energy. It's a whole other archetype. That brings up so many good questions. And I think it's like a, an ongoing thing I've been wondering about my whole life. Like essentially like when I, um, you know, Sun Eros, like I have been really compelled and motivated by these like peak experiences in love as far back, you know, I was dreaming about it before it happened. And then I was excited about it from a young age and whenever I was heartbroken or bereft, like say in high school, um, adults would just be like, you know, it's not all about passion or attraction. Sometimes it's just about someone you can trust. And I would be devastated. And I was like, but I want it all. <laughs> like, I would like to be uh, having an exciting time, like feeling really attracted to someone and having good chemistry with them and build a relationship. Why is that so offensive to people's sensibilities? So even just like as a teenager, I was confused about the messaging that I got from the world about essentially sex isn't that important. One day you'll have other priorities. And I was like, what are people talking about? And I feel like that's where Saturn comes in is that there is this kind of collective um, repression of like the tantric. You know, I don't think we're completely repressed as a society, like sex is everywhere. But in terms of like, the tantric or the deeper like mysteries, I think that's something that seems so just like fringe. But I'm like, what if that was considered more normal that people invested um, energy in their personal development, in their sexuality, in their relationships and in the sexuality in their relationships. And I feel like there's a discipline to that with Saturn where it's like, it doesn't just happen like that immediate passion or addiction or chemistry, yeah, that can be immediate. But cultivating like a steady fire with someone or in a container of trust, like that need not be, you know, two separate things where it's like you have your passionate encounters and then you have your stable love relationships. And that dichotomy has like haunted me, I feel like, honestly. So it's like a deeper question that I wonder about of culturally like why that's the messaging. Um, and I think a lot of movies, you know, and they portray that sense of just passion or like kind of getting struck by Cupid's bow and then a relationship happening and then the end. Like there's not a sense of like, yeah, we went to school, we studied Tantra, we went to these retreats, like we learned, some, you know, like if there's not that arc of investing in it in this kind of like deeper, like practiced way. But this is something I'm still like unraveling. So I'm really curious to like keep talking about that and hear what people have to say because it's mystified me for quite a while. 
Well, it's all an exploration, right? Ultimately, when we are exploring the archetypes of like the astrological symbols, the planets, the asteroids, how they show up in our chart, what we're really doing is finding a symbolic way to understand ourselves, to understand the cycles of our own life. And that really is a journey of a lifetime. And so I love that you're bringing in this other layer of understanding with these asteroids that maybe a lot of people don't really use as actively as they're not considered one of the major planets. And yet just listening to you and what I've learned in this time with you, I like my mind is just like expanded right about now um, because I'm seeing how adding these elements in, how much it says about what we go after, uh, what we pursue, but also in a sense, how we receive as well, what we think of as eros and passion and how that might differ from what we think of as love and where there is, as you mentioned, that dichotomy, right? It's, it's interesting because, yeah, we live in a time where it's almost like lust and sex is objectified, right? Like, yes, it's wonderful to live in places and societies where there is that sense of liberation because it does create, um, I think, a greater sense of equality compared to places where they don't necessarily have that sexual liberation or women's equality in the same way. But I think there's been a lot of focus on the sexual liberation of women and maybe not enough on the other ways in which um, women and other people are wanting connection with each other, are wanting mutual respect, are wanting equality. And that brings with it these other major players into the mix as well. But Eros and Psyche is so fascinating in and of itself. And so I have to say, I'm really, really looking forward to your talk. And once again, you guys, Sabrina is coming to Synchronicity University for the November speaker series. And for a very limited time, just about two weeks left to choose her tuition rate, as low as just $5 a class. And look, I think it's worth it just for Sabrina's class. I mean, just look at what you're gonna learn, how much I learned in this short amount of time. So I'm really looking forward to how you help us to further understand Eros and Psyche and Saturn and so much more in the chart. Sabrina, thank you. Thank you for being here. I loved talking to you, I have to say. I loved nerding out with you on these myths and how much you know. I am so impressed. I think it is so wonderful. Thank you, Nadia. This gave me so much to think about and got me really excited even more to be here um, and share about Eros and Psyche and Saturn soon. It's exciting for sure. And I'm looking forward to your class. And thank you again, Sabrina. And thank you everybody out there for watching. And until we connect again, take care. Bye.